This is part three of the New England Hemophilia Association's virtual consumer medical symposium. Uh, my name is Rich Pizzillo, and I am the executive director of the New England Hemophilia Association. Um, this session will be recorded. Uh, based on our community needs assessment, the consumer medical symposium was launched four years ago to help you better understand current and emerging therapies for bleeding disorders. This event was scheduled for March 28th in Rocky Hill, Connecticut, but due to COVID-19, we have made it virtual, just like everything else that is happening uh, currently in life. Um, this event will continue for the next couple of weeks up until August 8th. So over the past two weeks, we had Dr. Kathy Rosenfield from Tufts give a great overview of hemophilia, the current and future treatments. Last week, we had Dr. Eric Parnes from Brigham and Women's give an update about VWD and other rare bleeding disorders. Um, and tonight, we are super excited to have these great speakers volunteer their time to be with us tonight to talk about research, something that's so important, which has helped us to get where we are today. So I'll, I'll talk about them in just a minute. Um, our final event, which we'll learn a little bit more about um, later on, is this Saturday. So it's from 9 to 11.30. We have um, two sessions of psychosocial and insurance, and then you have the opportunity to, to uh, talk more with our industry sponsors. Um, and then of course, who doesn't love a scavenger hunt where we can win an Amazon gift card, which you'll learn more about on Saturday. And because you're registered for this event, you'll also get an email about it if you can't attend on Saturday. So I just wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors. This would not be possible if it wasn't for the support. So our presenting sponsors, Bayer, Biomarin, CSL Bearing, Genentech, Octopharma, Nova Nordis, Singalong Therapeutics, Spark Therapeutics, Takeda, Tremuf uh, Pharmaceuticals, and Unicare. Then I would like to thank our champion sponsor, Sanofi Genzyme, and our advocate sponsors, Acredo, Biomatrix, Cottrell's, CVS Health, Diplomat, Drugco, Griffles, Medexis, Paragon, Pfizer and Superior Biologics. If we were at camp, we usually do a single clap. So that's a single clap and a heartfelt thank you. <laughs> I wanna preview, cause you guys are the first to see this. This is what our virtual exhibit hall looks like. So it's just a preview, you will get the link to it, but it's really cool. Um, you, you will have the opportunity to see the companies and to interact with them. And this opens on Saturday. Um, also tonight, we're talking about zebra fish and we're just gonna put it out there that you may have a chance to win this. We are gonna give a mug away to someone <laughs> randomly tonight and it's called a certified zebrafish whisperer. So by the end of this presentation, we hope that you become an expert about this unique animal here. So with that said, I'm just gonna read a little bit about our um, speakers um, here tonight. So to, tonight's topic is called understanding research. It starts with the zebrafish. Our first speaker, Maria Santaella, I hope I got that right, Maria, is the former nurse coordinator at the University of Miami's Hemophilia Treatment Center. In 2019, she won the NHF Nurse of the Year Award. Today, she is a research nurse specialist at the National Hemophilia Foundation. Maria will provide an overview about the different types of research that are present in our community, including market research, HCC research, patient advocacy research, and clinical research. Dr. Jordan Shavit, is a board certified pediatric hematology and oncologist at the University of Michigan who has an extensive research background. He is a member of many boards, um, including MASAC, which is the NHF Medical and Scientific Advisory Board. Dr. Shavit will be speaking about how animals like zebrafish are crucial to future bleeding disorder treatments. Due to the generosity and the support that you give Niha, Niha made a pretty substantial contribution of $25,000 last year to the Judith Grandpool Fellowship Program. Both of our speakers tonight will talk about the importance of a program like this and fellowships that help to advance research for our community. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, for those that have um, been with us before, you know that we love to do polling. If you're new here tonight, grab your phone because we're gonna do some live polling. Um, so just give me one minute here and I'm gonna share. So we're gonna start with something fun. <laughs> we're all buying things online. What was the last thing you ordered online? This is all anonymous. You could be completely honest here. We do not track anything. You are gonna text 781-412-7971. Um, so we have sneakers, dress, um, let's see what else, a fishing pole, 
toothpaste, vitamins, toilet paper. I think I knew who that was, but I'm not going to say anything. Uh, Jeep parts, mattress cover. Uh, yeah, we are buying quite a bit online um, these days. Shoes, I think ink, ink masks. Um, so yes, quite a bit is uh, happening. Food saver bags. Ooh, we do love um, buying those types of bags. Coffee, broom, wall mount, and closet shelves. Nice. So clearly we are buying lots. Rich's autograph. Whoever bought that, clever. Thank you for saying that because uh, I would like to buy that myself. Barbecue sauce. I do not work for them, I, but I hope it's Sweet Baby Ray's. That is a plug if you haven't tried it before. It's a very good barbecue sauce. Um, all right, great. We can go on with this for uh, the next hour here, but we're going to advance to the next slide. Um, the next one is text yes, text no, and I'm not sure. So it's again, 781-412-7971. I know the difference between basic research and transla translational research. So one is yes, two is no, and three, I'm not sure. Um, so right now it's like the Kentucky Derby. We have no at almost 60% <laughs> followed by 27% with the yes and 17 unsure. So it looks like most people, which is totally okay because that's why you're here with us tonight to understand the difference between basic research and translational research. So I'm gonna go to the next question. I know the difference between surveys sent for market research and others sent for patient research. So that this is the difference of paid Usually pharmaceutical, it's a third party market research and other sent for patient research. So um, it looks like this is great. Um, about 92% for those that are calling in, uh, it's going down. 70% um, say yes, about 20% say no, and about 10% say I am not sure. So about three fourths say that they know the difference. So a couple of these, we're not gonna give you the answer because Maria is going to actually include it in her presentation, but we talked about how, it, how NEHA is supporting NHF to fund research. So this question is, NHF has funded research since the 2010s, 2000s, 1990s, 1980s, or 1970s. Um, again, 781-412-7971, text one for 2010s, 2000s, um, three for 1990s, text four for 1980s, and text five for 1970s. So the majority, again, about three fourths, think it's the 1970s. So um, that is great. We're not going to give you the answer. You have to edge on the, um, you have to sit on the edge of your seat for this one, um, and we will see it shortly. The um, two more questions to go. NHF funds blank in research each year. Text one for 250,000 to 350,000. Um, text five, uh, two for 450 to 550, three, 550 to 650, four, 750 to 850, and five, just about over a million dollars a year for research. Um, so it looks like we have the majority, almost half say, um, which is the five, almost a million dollars for research. And then we have about 20 to 30% for the 550 to 850. No one thinks it's 450 to 5, 550, and then a couple <laughs> for 250. The last question here is an open-ended. What's one thing you hope to take away from tonight's session? It could be anything. This is going to populate a word bubble. Um, so it's one thing that you hope um, that you could take away from this session. Let's see. We'll give it a, um, a couple of seconds here. It's understand. Absolutely. Understanding here. What is a zebrafish? <laughs> Learn something new. What is translational research? Great question. How others feels about research? Coffee mug. Someone wants that coffee mug. What is a zebrafish? <laughs> Great. Yeah, there's some, there's some um, understanding over here. How can I be involved in research? Great questions. Great questions coming in here. Um, I think if I had a pick, it's how do you get the mug and how do you get a pet as a zebrafish? But with that said, I'm going to Stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna have Maria um, uh, kick it off and share her screen now. Perfect, thank you, Rich. And thank you, Niha, for having me here tonight. I'm very excited, I'm delighted, I'm honored to be able to share um, my, my, my talk with you guys tonight. Oh, there you go, there was a slight delay, so here we go. So anyway, thank you for that great introduction. I won't take any time on this slide because you already knew the great, clever title that Rich gave this session. Um, so I, I thought that we would start with, um, hold on, let me move my, my, 
they was blocking it. Perfect. So I thought we would start with um, some a, a, a very simple definition of what research is, and it's really a systematic investigation that is designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge. Basically, gathering information, learning, right? And, and of course, this process can take many forms, and its ultimate goal depends on who's conducting the research, and what what are they conducting it for. So the goal of research, if you look into business, for example, well, maybe the goal of research is to be able to maximize sales and profit, right? How can we sell something super expensive and make the most money out of it? Perhaps uh, market research that we're also familiar, like Rich said in this community, it's all about understanding what the consumer needs and what the consumer wants and what their preferences are. Um, scientific research, which is something that we'll be speaking for the rest um, of the presentation, is actually the systematic investigation of scientific theories um, and hypotheses, trying to figure out how, how everything works from the science perspective. And the purpose is to describe, to explain, to predict, um, confirm, and just make us understand, better understand um, scientific concepts. But there's earth environmental sciences, there's chemistry, physics, you name it. Every um, area of study has uh, research involved in it. So who conducts or supports research in a community? There's a ton of, of organizations and individuals doing that for, for our, our, our betterment. So we have the ASIN, which is the American Thrombosis and Hemostasis Network, and I'll allude to them a couple times in this presentation. Obviously, we have the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Um, it's part of the NIH, and they actually support money funds to be able to um, conduct research. We have the multidisciplinary team at the NHS, uh, HTCs, I'm sorry, so talking about doctors, nurses, physical therapies, geneticists, um, whoever is in the um, hemophilia treatment center. But we also have other scientists that perhaps don't work in hematology at all, but can provide their expertise in areas like gene therapy or joint um, uh, research. Pharmaceutical companies, of course, they're always looking to create novel therapies to improve um, the, the lives of those who they treat. And we'll talk a little bit about them as well. We have obviously Hemophilia Federation of America and the National Hemophilia Foundation were two advocacy organizations that uh, are either directly involved or they partner with others to conduct research. And of course there's others, right? Because the list is always, um, is limitless basically. But most importantly, chapters in you, and that's why we're here today, is because without you, we would not be able to do many of the things that we do. Um, like Rich said, chapters and individuals donate to um, the National Hemophilia Foundation specifically to support research, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But also you, without you, um, we would not be able to understand things better, right? You are the ones who are living with the bleeding disorders. You are the ones who can volunteer so that we can learn uh, how to treat and how to understand um, the condition better. So for all of you who participate in research and to support research, um, a thank you. So you might say, oh wow, there's a lot of people conducting research. Is this redundant? Do we really need all these people doing research for um, in the same community? Well, if you look at this report done in 2018 by the International Rare Disease Research Consortium, they actually looked at the rare disease space and they looked what areas are being researched the most. And surprisingly, at least to me when I saw this, is that only 2% of research projects are on rare hematologic disorders. And mind you, we're not that 2%. We're part of that 2%. So if you look at bleeding disorders as a whole, um, only a fraction of the, uh, the um, research being done in the rare space is done in our um, community. Uh, obviously, rare cancers is at 47%. Cancer is a huge um, research area. Um, that 21% is rare neurological disorders, and that 8% is the rare um, developmental um, defects. So we're doing a lot, but we still have room to, to grow. So what are the types of um, research that we, we encounter in our community? So obviously we have basic re science research and this, uh, this research, even though it has the name basic in it, it's actually the framework. It's, it's actually where, where we help us understand diseases, they help us understand how, how the body works and help us figure out best treatments to, to fix whatever is going wrong, right? So um, this, this knowledge that we generate in this type of research is very, very important for everything else that we do later on. It happens, usually happens in the lab, 
and it usually uses cell cultures and animal models. So this is way before we do anything in humans. This is understanding um, science a little bit better. We also have interviews, and obviously this is more of a qualitative in nature, but it can also take many forms. It can be done by healthcare providers. It can be done by our industry partners, um, by anybody who wants to have direct um, contact with somebody who is living the experience that they're interested in studying. It could be in person by phone or like we're doing today with video conferencing. We also have surveys, like it was very exciting to see how you can tell the difference between a marketing um, survey and one that is based on, you know, is trying to understand maybe patient's experience a little bit more and it's used in, in research protocols. Again, it can be done by HCPs, healthcare providers or industry partners. They can be paid and unpaid. Usually marketing surveys are paid, but not always. Some, some, um, some research studies are paid, uh, paid for their service. They may contain patient reported outcomes, and this might be a word that you hear a lot. And these are tools, they're surveys, question tools, um, that they're trying to capture either pain or some kind of um, symptom that we're trying to study a little bit more. And they're, they're usually valid and reliable tools that are measuring what we want them to measure. Um, and of course, they can be done for marketing purposes as well. Focus groups is another one. Um, it can be done by healthcare providers and industry. This is usually a group of people, again, that are, that are part of an experience or that they all have a condition or a disorder, and we're trying to gather um, from them um, a little bit more in-depth information. So we can, again, it can be paid and unpaid. And advisory boards, although some are not, some don't consider them focus groups, they're, they're similar enough that I thought would be worth mentioning here because they happen in our community as well. And these are advisory boards, whether they're physician advisory boards, nurses advisory board, patient advisory boards, they're considered experts in, in whatever they're studying. And they, they actually bring them together to try to pick their brain to see if, um, if they can to learn from, from their experience. Surveillance is another one that is not necessarily research, but it's close enough. And because it happens in our community, I thought it would be important to mention them. And this comes um, all the way from, I think it was the, either, either the late 70s or the early 80s, um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, began a project called UDC, Universal Data Collection. Um, and it was a surveillance project um, mainly geared towards um, blood safety. You know, it was the era of HIV and hepatitis, and they just wanted to make sure that our blood um, supply was safe. This has morphed into a community count, which is now, uh, and CDC has partnership with ASIN, and we do it through, um, through ASIN. And it's a longitudinal study. So that what that means is that they, they follow patients over time, which is a great, um, we learn a lot more when we do things like that. Clinical data, well, this happens in the HDCs, right? So everything that we learn already in bi basic science, we're now using those concepts and we're, everything that we understood and we're, we're transferring to the patients. Obviously, we have to determine that it's safe for them to do that. But all those knowledge, all that knowledge that we're gathering, we're now ready to put it in the clinical um, setting. For example, you know, prophylaxis was a great idea. Maybe if we give people scheduled doses of factor, maybe we can prevent the bleeding episodes. Well, we don't really know that until we try it, right? And the only way to try that is to actually get patients who, are, who have hemophilia, put them on prophylaxis, and then compare them with those who are not on prophylaxis. So that's what clinical research looks like. And the translational part is like, because now we're translating all those concepts and everything that we've learned in the lab and in animal models, now we're translating them and trying to see if they, if they pan out in the in humans, in, in, in actual people. So Dr. Shavid will talk to you a little bit more about how that process works. And ASIN, like I mentioned before, the American Thrombosis and Hemostasis Network, like I said, is um, also working with the CDC for the community counts for the surveillance that we have going on in this community for a long time. But they also are now, um, they house a clinical data set. And so what it does is that patients register through their HDCs and all this information is pulled in an anonymous manner to, um, to, so that researchers can go into the data set with all this aggregate information and try to ask research questions and try to come up with, with answers. 
So that's where Athen is, is up to now. And, and Athen data is also longitudinal because we're collecting pa uh, patient information over time. Clinical trials data, if you didn't know about it before, you probably know about it now. Um, this is where pharmaceutical companies and HDCs partner with each other to try to make sure, to try to prove that their therapies are not only safe, but that they're also effective. So in order to do that, we have to, um, we have to try it in humans, and there's diff um, different phases, phase one, two, three, um, before they get um, in front of the FDA, who will look at all that data that is, being, that is gathered through all those years and decides whether indeed it was safe and effective um, and approved for, for marketing purposes. Lastly, I'm going to say a few words about registries because you may or may not know that NHF has a new patient registry. And what we're trying to do with a community voices in research, which was before my BDC, is trying to gather the patient experience. So Athens has been doing a great job of collecting um, clinical data. We want to know what is it really like to live with a bleeding disorder, both directly from the patients and their family members who are um, who are living with it day to day. So their parents um, are also included, unaffected siblings, anybody who has direct um, who's affected directly by the disorder. So if you haven't heard about it, you'll probably be hearing in the next few um, few um, weeks, months. And it's also the idea is for it to be longitudinal. So. The second half of my presentation is about NHS research and you. So how do we all put all this together um, from, from an NHS standpoint? So the goal of NHS research department is to improve the lives of people with bleeding disorders by closing the informational gap through the generation of knowledge and evidence. So this is what we live for in, in the department where I work. So how does NHS do that? Well, NHS conducts its own research we support research, right, um, funds, we provide funds to support research. Um, we're also form collaborations, so things like PROBE, Core Heme, um, we offer our, our uh, you know, our team will meet with other researchers in the field and collaborate in, in many projects. And like I said, we, all, we now have this registry that we're trying to um, represent the patient's experience, something that we felt was missing from, from a lot of our projects. But today we're only focusing on, um, on NHS-supported research. So NHS has been supporting research since the 1970s. So I was surprised to hear that, um, that most of you knew the answer to that. Um, I myself was surprised when I heard that. And we give about 900 to a million dollars of, of money, uh, dollars um, to support funding uh, research. Um, so we do that and because we try to focus in all levels of researchers and in all disciplines. So by doing that, we, for example, have the Judith Graham Pool, which we uh, call JGP. It's for fo postdoctoral research fellows. Um, and it's, this is for the early researcher conducting basic science. So this is for the baby researchers that are getting to the lab, you know, very early in their career. And we give them $52,000 a year for two years. And we've given over 100 uh, of these awards since 1972. This is also a very special award because this award is solely funded by chapters and individuals. So this award um, is, is not only special because it's creating the framework for what other what future science um, is, is going to, you know, it's going to need to advance, but also because it's funded by individuals. So we thought, we think that that's very special. We usually give about four a year. Career Development Award is for the mid-level researcher. Now, this is a researcher that has some experience already. Um, this has been going on since 2000. We've given out 27 awards, and we give $70,000 a year for three years. And we usually give uh, one every year or one every other year, depending on the funds. The Innovative Investigator Award, this is for any discipline uh, within the HTC team. team. Um, we've given four awards since 2018, so this is one of our new awards, and we give $60,000 a year for 12 um, to 18 months, so just one, one uh, big payment of $60,000. And we usually give about two to three uh, of these a year. The Bridge Award is uh, something very new as well. We've given two since 2018. 
we usually give one of these a year because it's very um, it's a lot of money it's 125,000 and um, this is for the researcher who's experienced who's actually applying for those NIH grants like I told you before that big um, governmental agency that gives a lot of money for research um, and they have a good application and they almost made it, but because the funds are limited, they didn't, they, it wasn't awarded to them. So what we do is we bridge them. We, we give them a little bit more fun. They're able to go back to the lab or try to gather more information, perhaps redesign their studies. And hopefully with that beefing up their application, the next cycle when they apply, then they're able to get this multimillion, I mean, hundreds of thousands or sometimes millions of dollars in, in funding. So this has actually been pretty successful. We've given um, two awards since 2018, and I think that both of them, if I'm not mistaken, they've actually gone to take to get um, NIH grants after this. The whole point of this is that we recognize early researchers, mid-level researchers, we we'll bring them in, we nurture them, we support their 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 research projects, and hopefully, not only will they complete their project successfully, but they can actually stay. For their um, for their professional career within our our community, we also have awards for um, nurses, PT, and social workers through the uh, working groups, and that's fifteen thousand dollars a year. These are usually um, educational projects, but they can be researched as well. And then, even though this is not necessarily research, it's important because Dr. Shavit will talk about this, um, NHF Takeda Clinical Fellowship. So what we do with this one is we give $100 a year for two years, also for early um, physicians, providers, um, to get hands-on clinical and research experience at highly regarded HDCs. So these, um, we've gotten 38 fellows to date, and the idea is again the same, to support people who have interest in our community, to be able to nurture them and be able and hopefully have them stay in our community for, for a while. So JGP funding, we like I said, $52,000 a year for two years, and a chapter can name and select a project when they cumulatively reach to 125,000. So as Rich um, mentioned, you guys gave us a very generous donation of $25,000 last year. Um, and for that, of course, we want to thank you. Uh, it was the second largest in the last five years. So obviously, we're very grateful, very, very excited about that. So when we look at the New England recipients, if you look at the pie chart on the right, you see that we have a total of 13. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit since who they were and what they were working on. But we have a total of 13. Most of them come from Massachusetts. Connecticut has two, Maine has one, and Vermont has one. But if you combine all of them, they have uh, there's a total of 13. So when you look at the left-hand side, they're actually, you guys are in the top tier, um, top three of, of our recipients. Um, so that's that's pretty remarkable as well. So this um, will show you, it's very busy, I understand, but I just wanna call your attention for a couple of things. So number one, the dates. You can see that we've been funding research in your area since 1973 and all the way up to last year. And of course, there's, there'll be more to come, I'm sure. So anyway, it's been going on for a long, long time. If you look at the fellow's name, um, there are names that we that we might recognize later on. For example, in 2016, 2018, we had, we had Sol Schulman uh, be a JGP fellow. Well, we received, I don't know, um, Dr. Shavid probably remembers, last, last week or the week before, we received an email saying that he was looking for for um, staff to work in his own lab. So not only was he a JGP fellow and he completed his project successfully, but he's now has his own lab in Beth Israel in, in your area. So that's pretty exciting. Um, that's exactly what we want um, this um, research support to, to look like. Um, and then if you look at the project title, when you look at the mentors, you probably recognize a few of the a few um, doctors in your area that are still there doing great work. But if you look at the project titles, you can see that these projects are all over it. Remember, this is basic science, right? This is the science that is done at the lab. Very important um, for, for the progress of, of bleeding disorders understanding and treatment. So um, you can see that they, they go with factor eight, um, human antibodies, so inhibitors towards antihemophilic factor, activation of factor five, von Willebrand factor, vitamin K dependence, which are two, seven, nine, and 10. Um, von Willebrand um, gene, plated storage um, 
fuel deficiencies, von Willebrand factor, prothrombin, which is factor two, um, von Willebrand patient adhesion, and even gene therapy. Our last project was about gene therapy. So very exciting, very important work being done in your area. And lastly, I just wanted to have a, a call for action so that you can be in the lookout for, this is my last slide before I transfer it to Dr. Shavit, but um, so the NHS is uh, hosting a state of the science summit, research summit in 2021. And we want, the goal we, of this summit is to align the community in, sh in shared research focus. So we want, uh, we want the community as a whole to identify research priorities and so that we can together work towards um, accomplishing them. And then also establish a functional platform that encourages partnerships and collaborations beyond the bleeding disorders community. So again, like I said, gene therapy could be a great um, collaboration or even joints, so rheumatology or orthopedics um, that can actually, we can pull from their expertise into our, our community. So the next steps are virt virtual listening sessions, which will take, um, many forms. They'll have providers, researchers, but also patients, chapters, family members. Um, we'll have a chapter-led survey um, to, uh, to understand the perspective from the chapter, um, from the chapters. And then affected individuals and families input, um, we're thinking to do it through surveys and utilizing the CVR for that. So stay tuned. You'll see a little bit more um, in the next months. And you, if you are not registered within the National Hemophilia Foundation to receive BLAST, do that because we'll be calling for your, for your help during, during this time. So without further ado, I'm going to stop my share now and let Dr. Shavit um, take over. All right. Uh, thank you, Maria. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, set up things for me very nicely. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And all right, you guys see swimming fish? All right, so yeah. those are zebra fish. Um, actually, I see a question that popped up that I'll just uh, or give Maria a chance to pipe in on. Uh, is there a public resource to view the JGP award uh, recipients going back to the 1970s? And I, th I know you've put that all together. Is, is that available online? Yes, um, it is. It is available online on our website. If you go to uh, our website, you can, it's kind of like buried in, in the providers and then you go to the research and then I'll be happy to share the link while um, Dr. Shavit is talking. We're also redesigning um, our website so you'll be able to, um, to find it a lot easier in this newly and improved version of our website. Um, I think it's in the fall when we're going to be um, launching it. But yes, there's a place where you can actually uh, browse through all the projects and all the different uh, fellows that we have. Thank you for that opportunity. All right. Yeah. And thank you. Maria worked really hard to put that list together. All right. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm honored for the invitation. And I just want to thank, uh, you know, your chapter for all you've you know, contributed. Uh, you've certainly made a difference to my career and as Maria showed to many careers of others. Like, like Saul Schulman, she pointed out, he got a big NIH award. That's why he was advertising. Uh, and I, I'm in the same position. So um, as you can see, these are what zebrafish look like. I, I, I'm going to pull up some questions along the way. I, somebody asked, I think somebody asked if they can get zebrafish. Um, I thought somebody said, oh, maybe that was in the, uh, the uh, text messages. You can very, very easily get uh, zebrafish from your local pet store. They're a uh, freshwater fish that are often used in aquaria to make sure that the water is safe before you put in your more valuable fish. They're very cheap. I ha I, if you come and visit my lab, I'll give you uh, as many as you want. We have, I don't even know how many we have, we have thousands of them. Um, so I'm uh, working from home. I actually was gonna talk from outside, but my wife stole the uh, location. So this was just sort of an apology of why I was going outside and you know, I get all sorts of distractions, but I got the cat out of here, so <laughs> I'm not distracted right now. Um, so, you know, the first question is, what is research? And Maria defined that really nicely already. This is sort of more of a functional approach. But before I go through this wheel, I want to, I think it's more important to say, why do we do research? And the reason, you know, there are many different reasons to do research. But the reason that you're all here for research is an example like this. All right, this is what hemophilia patients used to look like in this country. And unfortunately, in many parts of the world, they still look this, this way. This is what happens when you don't have access to factor. Right, you can see that this uh, poor boy's, uh, his right leg is, uh, has a flexion contractor. You know, many of you may have heard that term where he cannot extend his, his knee anymore. He's got a big swollen knee and you can see his thigh is very 
atrophic because he's using it. He's lost all his muscle mass. And certainly because of all the, the modern therapy we have, this is what our patients look like today. Uh, and this is what we want them to look like. So that's why we do research. And what we do is we make observations. You know, there's hemophilia. And what's wrong with hemophilia? They, they bleed. So that brings up questions. How does that happen? Let's search the literature. What can we find on that? What has anything been published before? We're always standarding on the shoulders of giants. And then so we develop a hypothesis, a theory, a guess. What, what's going on? Uh, well, it's bleeding, so maybe it's in the blood. So we do experiments on that. We collect the data, and we come to conclusions, and then we share those results through the literature or conferences uh, and develop ideas for therapies or, or ask new questions, and then go around and around and around. And that's what we have to do to, to be successful, because oh, well, I'll show you some examples. Um, you know, here's the factor nine gene was cloned in 1982. And what I want to point out is at the bottom, this was funded by the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia, so government uh, support for research. This is a cloning of the factor eight gene. This is done in the U.S. It was supported by Baxter, which, as I think most of you know, was the, you know where the hemophilia program that Takeda now owns used to be with Baxter. So th this was a partnership. It was Baxter, the Mayo Clinic Foundation, and this grant is a, a National Institute of Health, or NIH grant. Uh, von Willebrand factor, also same thing. And, and what these are, if I, I should specify, these are cloning the gene. So this means that now we've identified the gene and we have the sequence. And when we have that sequence, we can make that factor synthetically. And that's how most factor is made today. Uh, this is von Willebrand factor. Uh, we haven't made synthetic von Willebrand factor as much, but that's increasing. And this was supported by the NIH and the American Cancer Society. And this was actually cloned by my, my mentor, David Ginsburg. So this is, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. He, you know, he passed on uh, what he knows to me and I follow uh, in his footsteps. So the scientific method is important, uh, but it's really important to look at it this way. Where we are with the scientific method is mostly here in basic research, which Maria explained to you. To get from basic research to one FDA approved medication takes a lot of work and lots of medications die along the way which you can see that. And you may have heard of some, I don't know if I can think of any examples in hemophilia or von Willebrand disease space, but in many other fields, a lot of these die along the way. And what you need is you need thousands of worker bees, so to speak. You know, this is a thousand individuals, thousands of people like me doing research in their own area. And, and I'll show you why that's important. But they have to be doing that. And doing that all together means we can get to a drug. It doesn't mean each one of us is going to develop a, our own drug, but we do our parts. And it's sort of like this. This is sort of a tongue-in-cheek example. Right? Yes. This is from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Okay? So you remember Veruca Salt? She wanted it now. She wanted a golden ticket. Well, what was the fastest way to get a golden ticket? You know, Charlie Bucket, he walked into the store and he bought a single candy bar. He actually, I think he bought two and he got lucky and he got one. But how many kids bought one in the store and they bought their single candy bar and they didn't get any? Well, here, Baruch Assault did this. She had an assembly line. All these different people working in concert meant that you could get a winner, right? So maybe it's not the best example, right? I don't want to compare us to Baruch Assault. I'm, what the point is, is that it takes many individuals working together in parallel paths to often just to get to one drug. And so this is, uh, you know, and I'll show you the importance of that in this slide. Because if you look here, this timeline is a timeline of gene therapy. The first gene therapy trial was in 1992. I remember it because I was graduating college and I was entering uh, medical school. And I said, I saw that and I was like, I want to do that. Well, it took another 20 years before we got, you know, um, actual gene therapy. It took development of a number of different vectors. So in order to do gene therapy, you have to have the gene, which I showed you a few minutes ago, the genes for the proteins that are missing. And then you have to have a vector some uh, shuttle to get the gene to where it's supposed to be. You can't just throw DNA into, a, into the bloodstream and have it go. You, you, need, a, you need a cargo, you need a, a, a bus, a transport to get it there. And so that's what it, they're showing here. You may not be able to read this, but they're showing the different types of transports uh, using viruses. We're able to eventually get it there. And here in 2000, right after 2010, we had our first uh, successful trial of hemophilia for hemophilia B. So now, but if you look at how we got there, it can only happen because of that, that vector, that uh, transport system. 
And that transport system is a virus, and that virus is called AAV for adeno-associated virus. It doesn't really matter, but it's, it's a cause of a common cold. Many of us have been exposed to this over our lifetime. It was first discovered in the 1960s, which you can see here. Then they found the genes, like somebody found the gene for hemophilia, they found the genes for AAV here in around the, you know, 1980. And then they started to use it as a cargo to deliver genes. And then to the first um, successful therapies I told you about in the, around 2010. And then the first FDA approval was 2017. Now, one very important thing to note is that this is the importance of basic research, which the JGP funds. The um, AEV, people who found AEV in the 1960s didn't dream of using this for hemophilia or any other genetic disease. They were just interested in studying the biology of viruses. They're like, oh, let's understand viruses. In the meantime, back in the 19, probably more like 30s, hemophilia A protein was sort of identified. In the 1950s, they found that there was a hemophilia B and they were studying and they were all like, well, we just want to understand hemophilia, right? They weren't thinking at all about how they would get this gene in there if they ever found it. It was those two individual, you know, not just individual groups, tens or hundreds of groups working on each one of those problems who helped to lead to a solution eventually. You know, and one person in one group comes up with an idea and they publish it and the other group sees that and they're like, oh, I, I can make that better. And it goes on and on. But it takes those many different groups working in parallel to be successful. And of course, it takes money. You have to have money to pay for this. You have to pay people, you have to buy materials, you have to run labs. Let me tell you, it's, it's, it, it, it costs a lot of money. And unfortunately, we see pieces that, of that money going away uh, if you look over time. This is the funding rates for what's called the R01, which I think Maria might have mentioned. That's the major NIH grant uh, that funds research. If you want to do big research, you really need to get an NIH grant. That helps to keep the lights on in the buildings because you, know, you need buildings to do the research, to buy materials, and to, uh, to hire people to do the work. Unfortunately, the rate of funding for this used to be up in, you can see, 30 to 40 percent. This is different groups. This uh, blue curve is new investigators. I think we'll focus a little bit more on, this is the early career ones in red and the established ones here. You can see we were up at 30 to 40 percent. It went up around 2000. Bill Clinton uh, doubled the NIH budget and then it flattened. You can see it all reflected here and then the numbers went down. We've had little blips. This was actually around the recession. They put a boost in the, there to boost the economy and then down again. So, but we're, we're from 30 to 40% here down to 20 to 30%. And that makes a big difference. If people don't get these grants funded, they may have great ideas, but the work doesn't happen. Here's another graph. It shows that it's been harder and harder to get grants. You, your first one of these R01 grants used to be in the 1990s around age 35 to 40. Now it's age around age 45. And what happens is if it takes longer and longer to get those grants, people drop out. Uh, the institutions sometimes will kick them out if they don't have any funding or they get discouraged and they leave. Uh, here's more example of NIH funding. I told you about the NIH doubled its budget from two th around the early, uh, you know, starting in the late 90s and then that went through the early 2000s. Uh, and it hit around almost $40 million a year. And then it's dropped off to around 28. I think it's actually around 38 now. But had we gone on that same trend, we would be up to 60 million. And you know that has real consequences for how we do all sorts of things, including fighting COVID. You know the money in the NIH budget goes to fight COVID. It goes to hemophilia. It goes to all sorts of things. Uh, NIH funding is a share of gross domestic product. Uh, used to be around 0.25 percent, peaked at 2.5, and now it's around 1.5. So a really small part of the budget. So if we can just go from 1.5 to 2% or 2.5, you know, you're talking about doubling the NIH budget for not a whole lot of GDP. One of the problems is, and I don't want to get very political here, I want to keep politics out of this, is that funding for science has gotten a bit politicized. You know, uh, scientific discussions, especially right now, are politicized. Uh, Tony Fauci, for example, has been uh, panned in, uh, by certain um, uh, people who are, aren't happy with how things have gone with the epidemic. Tony Fauci, just to put a perspective for anyone who doesn't know, Tony Fauci is like me. He's like the hemophilia providers you know, Stacey Croteau, um, uh, Peter Coides, uh, we were, uh, 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 Dr. Parnas, who spoke last week, Dr. Rosenfield. All those, he started out like us as a physician taking care of patients and then gradually moved up. So any one of us could be in that position that day. So I just to put that in perspective, you know, we all have the best interests at heart. We're all trying the best. 
and that's what he's trying to do. And so um, I want to try to you know keep politics out of it. I think our all of our goals should be to support science, trust science, understand science, and that's part of the the goal of this presentation. Uh, and and that's the best way we can beat things like COVID and hemophilia or von Willebrand disease. So just a, a little bit more about that, right? So if you take um, there are the NIH is divided into study sections. So if I apply for a grant, my grant goes to a study section that has expertise in bleeding disorders. So usually about 50 to 100 people apply each time. This is 100 people. The rate of success is 10 to 15 percent. So out of all these excellent scientists who have great ideas, these are the number of people who are going to get the funding. And so it, it can be very discouraging and, and hard for people to maintain programs. And just think how much better we could do if we could double this number or triple this number. It shouldn't be all everyone. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying everybody, it's got to be good ideas, but this is too low for good ideas. What we think if we look at the grants that go in, probably about 20 to 30% merit funding, and it's we're only funding half. So when it comes to these things, this is an example from a diversity supplement program, a different issue, but it lays out uh, the, the uh, trajectory of somebody going into the sciences. So starting as a college student, going to a graduate student to get a PhD or medical school to get an MD. And then after that, you should do further training as a postdoctoral fellow and then become faculty. And what you see here, there are NIH grants all along the way to support this. But like the grants I've been telling you about, those other grants, uh, the R01, the, the main lab grants, these training grants are also underfunded and there's not enough of them. And that's where you know, donations like yours have made a big difference. So uh, Maria talked about the JGP, uh, the Takeda Grant the Fellowship. So I was awarded both, of, I applied to both of them at the same time, which is something that you, some, you know, what you can do if there's multiple opportunities. I was fortunate to be awarded both and I, but you can only take one. So I took the Takeda, but you know, having the JGP um, is meant that somebody else could take that slot and do, you know, do that, do work, uh, get work, money for their work. And then I was fortunate to get the Career Development Award, which helped bridge me as I was starting my first faculty position. Uh, and then I was able to get NIH funds. So really a big thank you to all of you, because it, it really helps. Even though I didn't take a JGP directly, as I said, having these multiple funding opportunities uh, is a great resource for the, for the community. So my journey was uh, what was just mapped out there, college. I did an MD and a, a PhD degree. So I got scientific training in medical school. I uh, did a residency in pediatrics, a hematology fellowship, became faculty. Uh, and then I started uh, working with Maria uh, and Michelle Whitkop on the, uh, with the NHF for the NHF uh, grant review program. And that also made me a part of MASAC. And uh, Neha wanted me to say a little bit about MASAC for those of you who don't know. I think, I think many of you may know, but in case not, I think it's a, a good, good for you to be aware. So MASAC is the Medical and Scientific Advisory Council of the National Hemophilia Foundation. It was created in 1954, and it's composed mostly of the kinds of people you see in clinic, right? So physicians, nurses, social workers, physical therapists, maybe you see pharmacists as well. It also has scientists and, uh, and some consumers as well, people like yourself. And what we do is we, uh, one of our primary things is to make recommendations and advisories on treatment. So Heme Libra comes out, we study it, we make a recommendation. And those change over time. Um, some of you may know about CIPIT, which was the big debate about should you use plasma derived factor or synthetically made factor. We had a, a, an advisory on that. Uh, we have uh, we have somebody on there who's an expert in in liver because of all the issues with uh, hepatitis C uh, over the years for hemophilia patients. And there's been more than 400 communications covering. Uh, treatment of disease, prevention of disease, also infectious disease complications, which was important for uh, in the HIV era, uh, as well as hepatitis C. And this guidance is used not only by physicians, uh, but also by institutions and then insurance companies. Uh, it's very helpful for us if we have a MASAC document that supports access to factor. That's something that you and your provider can take to your insurance company and say, look, here's this body that supports it. You know, uh, please don't, you know, please allow me to get certain factors. And I'm sure many of you have been through times where you've been blocked from getting uh, uh, therapy that you need. All right, in the last few minutes, I'm just gonna talk about my research uh, and why we use zebrafish. So um, 
And I'm just looking at the questions that were asked because I was going to try to incorporate some of these things. So somebody asked, are other animal models used besides zebrafish? Absolutely. Zebrafish is a minority. There's actually, I can count on one hand how many people are using zebrafish for clotting disorders. Uh, the, the, prior, the most used uh, animal is mouse. Uh, but I can tell you, when I was an undergrad, I worked in a lab and we used all sorts of different animals. Uh, Non-human primates were used, bunny uh, rabbits were used, uh, sometimes dogs, there are dogs with von Willebrand disease uh, are used, so uh, zebrafish are the minority. But it has some unique features that I'll tell you about. So when it, but when it, the reason we use it is, first of all, I, what I want to mainly understand is the genetics of bleeding disorders. And bleeding disorders are, um, uh, the, uh, you know, they're defined by a mutation in a particular gene, like factor eight, factor nine, or von Willebrand factor. The thing is, we all have about 20,000 genes. So you might have met some people who have mild or moderate hemophilia who don't bleed very much, and others who bleed a lot, same with von Willebrand disease. And that's because we have other genes, 20,000 of them, that will change the effects. So somebody might have some genes that make them more protected, uh, that maybe help in the absence of factor eight, and other people don't have those genes, and that can make a difference for why you might bleed more or less. And if we can identify these modifier genes, we might be able to predict which individuals are at higher risk of bleeding. So if you have a, a child with a moderate hemophilia and you don't know whether they're gonna bleed or not, if you can identify these genes, you might be able to predict it. And you might say, actually this moderate patient that we might not have put on factor should go on factor. Uh, and then it could also help to guide, to guide therapy, like I just said. So why do we use zebrafish? Well, the power of doing genetic studies and getting at genetics is having large pedigrees. So human pedigrees are relatively small. You can't manipulate them, of course. Mouse pedigrees are actually very large and they can actually, they're sort of infinite based on mouse genetics, but they're very expensive to house. And the reason we use zebrafish is because their pedigrees are huge. A single mating pair can produce two or 300 offspring and they can do that on a weekly basis. And so it makes it much cheaper to house them. As I said, I have, uh, several rooms of zebrafish. One room can hold probably about 5,000 fish. In that same room, we might be able to hold 1,000 mice, maybe even less. Uh, and then you have to feed the animals and take care of them, and that costs money. So uh, there have been genetic studies in zebrafish going back to the 1980s uh, using different technologies. Some of you may have heard of CRISPR, which is a, a form of uh, genetic engineering that we use. And we've used that to make a whole bunch of different models. So somebody asked if there, there's any research ongoing for rare bleeding disorders. Uh, we, we have models of nearly every coagulation factor disorder that you can name, factor 10, thrombin, factor five, factor eight, factor nine, von Willebrand factor, factor seven. So, um, and, and we're not the only ones. People are modeling that in the mice uh, and, and people are doing a lot of work on rare bleeding disorders. So the genes and functions are essentially the same. I was gonna leave it at that, but somebody asked a question is if there's any differences between the clotting cascade and zebrafish in humans, and how does that affect my research? So there are some differences. I wasn't gonna go into that, but for example, there's no factor 11 in zebrafish. And that just means we have to account for that. The, the way quite, factor 11 comes before factor nine and eight. Uh, so um, we just have to account for that, that we won't be able to study factor 11 and learn about that and that the activation of factor eight and factor nine is a little bit different in fish than it is in, uh, in mice and humans. Um, otherwise, they're, they're mostly the same. Uh, the other big difference is that fish don't have platelets. They have thrombocytes, which are nucleated cells, but they act a lot like platelets. And I'll show you some uh, uh, pictures of that. And why is zebrafish so closely connected to our DNA? You know, that's a great question. I, you know, I don't know exactly how to answer that. It's just, they just are. Uh, I mean, zebrafish are vertebrates. Uh, so it's the same reason why are mice and humans very closely connected for their DNA and why aren't um, insects? Uh, it's just the way evolution went. And we are just, you know, uh, zebrafish are vertebrate animals. We are vertebrates. And so vertebrates diverged. They separated 400 million years ago, which is a long time, but we've still kept a lot of traits over that time. As opposed to, say, worms, we diverged from them a lot longer ago. I don't know the exact number, and so we're very different. Um, all right, so one of the other advantages to using the zebrafish besides how many offspring they make is that they go from a single cell embryo to a free swimming larva in three days. So this larva has every major organ system, including a beating heart and circulating blood and then an intact clotting system. And they're also very tiny. We can keep about 100 in a Petri dish, which is about 
10 centimeters across. Uh, and then we can also put them in these. This plate here is about the size of a three by five card. And it has a whole bunch of little wells. So it's like a, a bunch of test tubes. And what you, if you can see in there, I hope, is that there are little larvae swimming around in there. And what we do is we have models of bleeding disorders. And we can put a chemical in each well to treat them to see if we can find a new treatment for a bleeding disorder. So we could try uh, in this, there's about 50 wells, so we can try 50 new compounds. Um, we can induce uh, clotting by injuring the blood vessels. This is a blood vessel of the fish uh, we, with a laser, for example, and we can injure the lining of the blood vessel, and that can lead to blood clots. And in our bleeding mutants, they don't clot. I don't have uh, movies of that, but what you can see here is we did the laser, and you see the formation of a blood clot that eventually blocks off the flow. And we can put in fluorescent molecules, uh, clotting molecules. And you can see here that the blood clot, this is in the venous system, the veins. Uh, this is a blood clot. This is a fibrin blood clot, which is what hemophiliacs, hemophiliacs don't make properly. Whereas in the arterial system, we primarily see thrombocytes, the platelet equivalent, when we do the injury, forming a clot. And this is what we see in heart attacks. Heart attacks are usually in the arteries, uh, and they are platelet-rich clots. So very much similar to what we see in humans, platelet-rich clots and fibrin-rich clots in the artery and the vein. Now we've done some uh, imaging electron microscopy of whole blood from adult fish. And this slide is interesting because what it's showing you is a electron microscopy. These are blood cells. You see all these blood cells from a fish, a human, and a mouse. And you can't tell which is which. They all look the same. So they all form these what are called polyhedrocytes, sort of like 20-sided dice. If any of you played Dungeons and Dragons, you can see they have these sharp edges to them. And they all look the same. This one's the fish, that one's the mouse, and that one's the human. So, um, <laughs> the, uh, so what we want to do with fish is we want to find new activators of clotting. We want to put um, our fish in the, those little plates with the little wells, with the little te test tubes, the three by five card shaped plate. And then we can follow with, we can see fluorescent blood cells circulating around. And we did a test of a bunch of compounds and we found one, which you can see here, it completely blocked up the vein. It formed a big clot in the vessel, the, the, the venous system here. And when we looked at that by electron microscopy, this is without the treatment. You see these nice normal looking round blood cells. And in the treated one, you can see this stuff here is fibrin, which is the clot that hemophilia patients are missing. And you can see these blood cells here are showing that polyhedrocyte shape, like the 20-sided the dice I was showing you before, showing that this compound is activating clotting in these fish. Uh, this compound is something we probably couldn't use as a treatment, but it gives us ideas for how we could. And we're continuing to look at new compounds to see if we can find something. And so these, the goal of this is, there was another question about are there any oral treatments for hemophilia. The goal of this is to try to find an oral treatment for hemophilia. So uh, that's it. Uh, you can see this is a team effort. I collaborate with, with groups from Boston Children's Hospital, for example, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts General Hospital. We get funding from multiple organizations. And thank you again, National Hemophilia Foundation, uh, but National Institutes of Health. And um, uh, yeah, and that's it. So uh, here's some other, we have different kinds of fish here. These are called Casper fish because you can see through them. And uh, I, I want to thank you for your attention, and I, I'm looking forward to uh, more questions. Fantastic. Well, Maria and Dr. Shavit, thank you so much for an incredible presentation, um, not, not just about research, but um, how does this all happen? I think so many times that when we're seeing such an exciting time in the bleeding disorder community, um, how we go forward. And as the title said, starts with the zebrafish. Um, you definitely have me sold. I think I'm going to start uh, a little uh, zebrafish club here in Providence and see if I could get some of my uh, uh, family and friends to join me um, you know, with this. So with that said, there's a couple of questions about um, zebrafish. Can stem cells help hemophilia patients? Um, yeah. And how do zebrafish play a role in that? So that's, that's a wonderful question. Zebrafish, I don't see zebrafish playing a big role in that right now. Um, there's sort of two interesting answers. So one answer, I, you might have noticed I pointed to Boston Children's Hospital as one of our collaborators. Uh, one of the, uh, a guy named Len Zahn, uh, who's there, who's been working on the zebrafish and hematology, not clotting, but he, uh, hematology for 20 years and, and really revolutionized the, the field. Uh, 
he actually did some experiments using uh, trying to find new therapeutics in those multi-well plates that I showed you. And he actually found a compound that helped enhance stem cell growth, hematopoietic stem cell growth. And he showed that in fish and then in mice and then in primates, that if you treated the bone marrow with this compound, you could enhance their ability to get a bone marrow transplant. And so I think that's how the zebrafish has, has definitely helped in that area. And he actually took that compound to a clinical trial, which is ongoing. Uh, I don't know what the results are yet, but the early results were, were very positive. Now, so that helps hematopoietic stem cell transplant, bone marrow transplant. The way those stem cells can help hemophilia patients is actually there is a trial that just started uh, at the Blood Center of Wisconsin where they are taking uh, hematopoietic stem cells, bone marrow stem cells, they are in, for hemophilia patients with inhibitors in particular because inhibitor patients can't get gene therapy. And they are putting in the corrected gene uh, for, I can't remember if it's factor eight or factor nine or both, and they're putting it under control elements so that it will only be expressed in platelets. And so what happens is they, you, and they engineer the, the blood stem cells in culture, put it back into the patient through a transplant, and then hope that it will make platelets that express factor. And platelets will go to the site of a clot and they will release the factor there so the inhibitor can't get to the factor, right? Because I think most of you know inhibitors, if you try to infuse factor into patients with inhibitors, that factor is cleared away and it does no good. So it's been shown in mice that this works. If you put the, the factor in platelets, the platelets bring it to this clotting site, the inhibitors can't get it, you know, can't clear it, uh, you know, before they do their job. And so that's one way it might help. Uh, it's not going to be common. Uh, it's only for inhibitor patients because there's gene therapy. You, you don't want to go through a bone marrow transplant if you don't have to. And so this is more, at least right now, there, there are a lot of risks with bone marrow transplant. So it's not something you would want to do if you weren't in that situation. Great. Thank you so much um, for that answer. Um, I'm going to skip to uh, the chat. There's, there was a question in here about MASAC. Um, how often does it meet? Um, and do, does MASAC issue statements or updates only when needed, or is it a proactive kind of scheduled meetings? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the meetings are scheduled. The statements are a little bit of both, you know, but usually they're, you know, responding to something or a concern in the community, but they are proactively meeting. So we meet twice a year, uh, usually in conjunction with uh, the NHF Bleeding Disorders Conference. So it's usually the day after. Uh, it's been, it, it's moved around a little bit, uh, you know, at, at different times. And it, uh, it's publicly uh, open. So if you're at NHF BDC and you have, you know, time, unfortunately, I think it often overlaps with sessions, uh, but you can come in and watch as sort of a, a gallery, you know, it's not really, you know, some seating for people. Uh, to, to listen. Uh, the first time I listened before I was on it, I thought it was very interesting. I felt like I was watching Congress or something. And um, the, it's going to be, uh, you know, by Zoom this year. I don't know if it's going to be available for the public. I, I think it still will. I, I presume that the public will still be available. So uh, you can, you, I can find out for you or you can contact anyone. Or, so Rich has connections and you can, you know, talk to the people at NHF to, to find that out. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we're going to switch over to COVID. You know, you mentioned um, it's the hot topic now. There's a lot of talk of a vaccine, and I think your slide really showcased um, what goes through. So question is about a vaccine itself. We, we keep hearing fast tracking, and you demonstrated um, how many times uh, something in clinical trials or with animals may fail. Um, can you explain a little bit about the vaccine process and what we can expect in general as we enter into later this year and next year? Yeah, I can talk about very generally, you know, it, it, there's, I, I think there's literally a hundred different companies uh, that are working on vaccines. The general principle of a vaccine is you take the proteins that are on the outside. If you've seen those pictures of COVID with the little red spikes, you know, they have little spikes sticking off. Those are proteins that help it to become infective, but they also identify it. So the idea is to take those proteins and test them in the lab to see if they can induce uh, an immune reaction to those so that your body will produce antibodies. And those antibodies will then go and bind to that and clear virus away before it can cause infection. 
so the process is to get the right proteins. You know, the proteins can't change too much. Viruses mutate, change their, their, their sequences, their structures. The, the reason we never had a, a vaccine for HIV is because it changes a lot and changes rapidly. I heard some good news about the early sequencing information of, of COVID uh, is that it doesn't change as rapidly as, say, the flu. The flu reshuffles itself every year. That's why we have to get a flu shot every year. If COVID doesn't reshuffle itself as much, we might be able to get a one-time vaccine, but that's not clear right now. But the idea is to get the right proteins, get them injected, you know, get them uh, inducing immune responses, and then testing them on people. Uh, different companies have used different ways to get those proteins. That's more technical. I won't get into that. The difficult, the big difficulty though, is testing them, right? So even if you get a vaccine tomorrow or a month ago, you have to test it in a small group of patients first to see how they respond before you start going and, and doing it all over the population. Uh, and that's what that's why it takes a long time, and that's why you know the minimum estimates were were a year. Um, I think there was, uh, yeah. So that's. Uh, and then, oh, so the other thing is, you know, if you, if you take our Veruca Salt metaphor, you know, the companies are like Veruca Salt. Well, no, we're, I guess we're like Veruca Salt and the companies are all, you know, going about their, their best. They're not all working together necessarily because they all want to make money, right? I guess they're like Veruca Salt and then their people are like the, the factory workers. And they, they're all looking for you know, that golden ticket because they know they'll make a lot of money. And we all want them to do it because the, the company that can do it well and make a lot of money will help us. Right, so that that goes that goes hand in hand, uh, but you know we're go it, it is much faster than it has been historically because we have all this infrastructure in place, all this money that supports the NIH and all these different people working on AAV. But it's not just you know uh, or AAV is one thing, and I'm talking about gene therapy. But people working on understanding viruses, somebody studying influenza virus, is learning principles that are helping us to understand COVID viruses. Uh, COVID viruses, coronaviruses, actually are, are well known in animals. So there have been people who study coronaviruses for years uh, in, I forget what kind of livestock, and that kind of information helps us. Now, the problem with funding for science sometimes is that somebody might look at that funding and say, why do we care about a coronavirus in a bat, uh, right? What is that? How is that going to help us? Well, now we see why it's going to help us. So doing basic science, very basic research in many different areas is the best thing to help us. And all that work and all that infrastructure now is why we're able to kind of uh, go through things so rapidly. So Rich, should I go on about the, the question about COVID and bleeding disorders? Yeah, 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 that's, that's a perfect segue. What, what research is underway to understand COVID and bleeding disorders? So what we found for COVID, it, what, what is, it's still a little controversial, but the, it's, you know, a lot of data suggests that uh, it's not necessarily bad for bleeding disorders, it causes thrombosis, which is too much clotting, you know, pathologic clots in the veins. That you don't want to get. We know that patients who are sick in the hospital, especially with uh, severe viral infections in the ICUs, get clots. It, the data seems to suggest that, that the COVID patients are getting clots a lot more uh, than your typical average patient, although there, I think there's been a lot of bad research published as everybody rushes to publish, so I think when the dust settles we'll hopefully get a better idea, um, but there's a lot of people who study clotting in general who are looking at this. For bleeding disorder patients, the biggest issue is just in general not an issue unless they get sick and are in the ICU. So if you're in the ICU and now you're at risk of getting these pathologic clots, thrombosis, patients with bleeding disorders are at that risk. And so what, what a lot of patients, just regular patients are being treated with uh, who are in the ICU, they're being given blood thinners. Uh, but blood thinners and bleeding disorders is not a great combination. So the tricky part there and what we've been looking into, you know, what people are looking to as they treat patients is watching out for any patients with bleeding disorders and treating them a little bit more cautiously with the blood thinners. And there's been some reports on it. And so far, I haven't heard of any major problems where a bleeding disorder patient got put on a blood thinner and instead had a lot of bleeding. So it, it doesn't seem to be a major issue in general. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Shavid. I know there's a lot of uh, unknowns <laughs> there, but Great job explaining that. A couple more questions um, before we wrap up. Question is, how can NIH funding be increased? Mm, yeah, great, great question. The way NIH funding can be increased is to communicate to your representatives that you think this, this is important, Ad, advocacy. 
And NHF can, and probably NEHA can help you with that if you don't know how to do it and you want to get involved in that. NHF has, uh, what do we call, what do they call it? Something days? Uh, Washington days. days. What is uh, it? Washington days. Washington days. Washington and, days. And probably most states have it. I know in, in Michigan, we have cap capital days or something uh, where people go to the Capitol and talk to their representatives, call, write, uh, advocate, uh, and educate. And we're, we're our community, you know, the, the scientists and the physicians, where we have the responsibility to, we need to educate more. That's why I like doing things like this. You know, I like sharing this with you uh, and, and educate and try to get science out of the politicking. So um, the, you know, that I don't, I don't want to get into it, but, you know, I just have to say that COVID, it's very clear and we know so much about how viruses work and are transmitted. It is just so clear that masks make a huge difference. I think even more than social distancing. Well, masks are a way of you know preventing it without, in the case where you're not distanced. Obviously, if you're 100 feet away from people and you're never coming into contact with people, then you're going to be safe. But if you are going to be out and about, masks are so important. I think even more than washing your hands. Now, still wash your hands, but uh, you know surfaces, you know getting the virus on surfaces. I think I, I I can't say 100%, but I think that hasn't been as big of an issue. I think the most issue has been respiratory spread and wearing a mask. If you look at other countries, what they've done makes such a difference. If we were all, had all been wearing masks since March, uh, we wouldn't be where we are now. We, we would have flattened the curve. We would still have to wear masks, right? So it wouldn't give us freedom away from masks. We would be stuck with masks and we're going to be stuck with masks and distancing until there's a vaccine. But it, it, it's just so clear and it's just been so politicized where certain leaders don't want to, you know, even, you know, if we, I don't want to talk about Donald Trump, but if we talk about like governors of certain states where the cases are clearly, clearly going up and they are still not willing to make mask mandates or to say that they believe that's important. I, I, you know, I could just go on and on. It's just so important. And it's just become, it's become politicized, you know, and criticisms of, of Tony Fauci and saying that he's changed his mind or, or this or that. If you look at the statements he's made in full context, it was always, you know, sort of with a caveat, like we don't fully understand. This is what we think right now. And when a good scientist will change their mind when they get new data, you know, that's how I'm trying to think of a good example of theories that have changed over the years. I, this is a silly example. The first thing that comes to my head, the earth is flat, right? There may have been some scientific, scientists of the day who believed the earth was flat. And then somebody came up with data to show that it was round. And, you know, that it, it, the, the best scientists will say, oh, my God, I'm wrong. The Earth isn't flat. It's round. Look at this data. It clearly proves it. Uh, and that's why you'll see recommendations changing. And it's very frustrating, and it's frustrating to me, too. But, we, you know, we do the best with what we have at the time. Well said. Um, a couple more questions. I know we're a little bit past um, the <laughs> Here. So if you do need to run, um, by all means, this is being recorded, but we'll ask a couple more. So this question is, and I'm glad, you know, there is no wrong question here. They're all valid. Um, the question is, is it a worry that doctors could favor a particular pharma company if that pharma company is contributing to the doctor's research or employment position? Um, what can be done to prevent this? Yeah, that's a great question. And I should have said at the beginning of the talk that I've done consulting. Uh, for several pharmaceutical companies. I don't think it really uh, was relevant on what I was talking to you about. Um, but I, for, uh, I'll name for Takeda, and I try to do for a lot of them. So I'm not too biased to any, you know, anyone, Takeda, Bayer, CSL Bearing, Spark, Novo Nordisk, Okta Pharma. I've done consulting at one time or another for all of them. And I, I do think it is a concern. The only way to totally eliminate that would, would honestly be to stop it. I mean, it's always a risk. Uh, for, for that. I think full disclosure is what's most important. Um, and now, and you can get uh, funding from pharmaceuticals for your research. So some of the funding we mentioned, I don't know if we were clear about that. I, no, I think you know, Maria said that some of it is supported by pharmaceuticals. I had the Takeda Fellowship. It's called the NHF Takeda Fellowship. Uh, I've had uh, funding from other sorts that uh, go through the pharmaceuticals and it's difficult. So the only way to clearly remove the bias would be to remove it all. But I do believe that we have a very tight relationship in our area, you know, all of us, uh, from the consumers through the healthcare professionals. I do think that it's been a, a net plus 
even though at some times it may, you know, border on, on you know, con concerning behavior. But, you know, the pharmaceuticals give money, the kind of grants at least that I've applied to for the pharmaceuticals are what we call investigator initiated research, where I put in a project idea, they decide whether or not to fund it. They don't tell me what to do with the money. You know, they approve or they don't approve. They don't say, well, you know, we'd really like you to look at it this way. So we'll give you the money if you do that. Uh, you know, at least my research doesn't involve that. But other people do, but to, you know, to do the trials that got Heme Libra approved and to, you know, the newer factors approved, that a lot of that money came from pharmaceuticals, you know, through centers and covered, helped cover physician salaries to do them. And uh, so there may be some bias, but, uh, but it got us some really great products. Uh, so it's tough. I think, so full disclosure, being out in the open and trying to do trials head to head, which some companies have talked about of products to really see, because that usually doesn't happen to see Heme Libra versus say uh, a Dynavate, you know, head to head. Let's see, let's see what's, what's best. Great. And, and, you know, the follow-up to that, um, <laughs> that actually Dr. Rosenfeld was asked this very similar question. Um, this individual had, uh, is asking that they feel pressured from their physician to switch to a certain product and they don't want to switch. Um, any suggestions as the struggle as new treatments come out that if they're on the same product and they're doing well, how can they work with their provider to not feel pressured to switch if the provider is pushing them to do that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really tough question. So I can tell you what I do. Uh, and, and add on to one other thing, though, about the question about um, how to eliminate the, the pharmaceutical bias. The other way I didn't think of would be to increase government funding. Getting, getting that money coming from the government instead of pharmaceuticals would, would help to do that. So when it comes to, you know, what I do for my patients, and I sometimes feel like I'm pushing, but I, I, I try, I, I, I'm, I, I do this for the patient benefit. Every time, you know, patients usually come in, the severe hemophilia patients, for example, every six months, and I tell them every visit what is new, what's out there. You know, I talk to them about the new products, gene therapy. I'm a pediatric hematologist, so gene therapy is not going to be applicable to my patients for a long time, but I like to tell them about it. And I lay it out and tell them of all the different products, the advantages and disadvantages. And I, I, I sometimes feel like I'm pressuring them because I do it every visit because I think it's important because I don't want them coming to me and say, you never told me about this. Uh, but there are some patients who, after a number of visits, it's clear that they are not interested in switching. So I usually tone it down a bit. But what can you do? I mean, I think the best thing to do is to, it, the only thing you can do is tell your provider that you feel, you know, you're feeling a little uncomfortable or you're feeling like they may be trying to, pre you know, pressure you towards one and you're happy and you, you know, uh, if they could just, you know, tell you about any new advances, if you want to know about any new advances, but otherwise you really just like to stay on your, on your product. And again, this is, I'm presuming that there aren't some um, medical reasons why they might want you to switch, like you're having too many breakthrough bleeds, for example. Uh, but I, I think you just need to be straight with them. Or if you're uncomfortable or, or they're not receptive to that, find a new provider. Unfortunately, I know that's not always uh, an availability, although I think in the New England region, there's, you have a high density of providers. Uh, these, thank you very much. Great answer. These two are, we're going to consider as rapid fire, right? So sure. yes, no, um, just <laughs> for the sake of time. I'm not good at that. I'll try. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, if a patient with hemophilia had COVID, would you hospitalize them? Um, not based on their COVID symptoms. Okay. So just based on their COVID symptoms, not based on their hemophilia. Great. Um, masks definitely work. Um, can, do we need to cover our nose most? What about other pathways, eyes, ears? Can droplets of COVID enter those as well? Yeah, uh, great question. So, uh, sorry, not entirely rapid fire. Always yeah, keep your nose covered. It drives me crazy. To see this, can you see? All right, that drives me crazy. Um, uh, not mouth and nose must be covered. Uh, yes, they can. Get eyes. I don't know about ears, but eyes uh, could be a portal. So if you are very worried about it, you can wear a, a, a face shield. You know, get yourself one, uh, buy one if you can find one, or make one. You know, a plastic face shield with a mask. I was in a, a, a grocery store once, and at the checkout, I saw. A young woman with a mask, I mean a face shield, but no mask. I, I went to another line and mentioned it to the manager because that's that's not protective. So, but if you want to be fully protected, yes, uh, uh, you uh, a face shield would be uh, in addition. But but the mask, you know, it, it has it has to be. I could. I don't know. Are, are there kids in the room? <laughs> 
I mean, you can make, you know, multiple barriers if you think about other things where we protect ourselves from infectious disease, you know, sometimes you have to do multiple tasks to prevent certain things, multiple paths. <laughs> awesome, awesome answer there. And yes, for those wondering, we had Wicked Strong Family Masks. There could be a Wicked Strong Family Shield coming out soon. So stay tuned, you could wear it with your mask <laughs> or your snood. Um, <laughs> Have fun with masks, you know. Yeah. I, I've been having fun. I don't have any in my room here, but I, you know, I got some University of Michigan masks. I've got this black one that makes me look like Darth Vader or something, you know. Get, uh, we were gonna. Uh, there's a, a company locally that's uh, a, a printing company, you know, like makes T-shirts, and they sell masks, and they are gonna they put decals, and people were trying the masks. I guess they didn't like the masks, but if they did, we were gonna put fish on them. So you know, <laughs> have fun with it. Well, I think that we're all going to be rocking our zebra fish mask soon. With that said, we're going to do our mug. But as we call out, and we did randomly select three people, three are going to get the mug. So you and um, so stay tuned on that. But we notice in your bio, as we call out these names, you're in the zebra fish disease model society. Please, what is that? I mean, do you guys hang out and drink beers <laughs> with zebra fish around you? Um, what does it mean to be in a zebrafish disease model society? Well, before the zebra, there was the zebrafish disease model society. There was the zebrafish. Uh, uh, there's the International Zebrafish Society, which held a, a conference on. They both started with conferences. That one had the zebrafish conference on genetics. I think going back into the 1990s, and the original people who worked on zebrafish. They worked on that window of development from that single cell to that larva at three days old because it's a great sort of fast way of looking at development. If you look at humans, development's nine months. In mice, it's three weeks. And, in, uh, and uh, one thing I think I forgot to mention is that there's no pregnancy. It's all external. So you can just see it in front of your eyes. So the people who first started doing that were looking at early development. For any biologist, developmental biologist, you'll know things like gastrulation, uh, formation of the first germ layers. This is, you know, things that go on after your cells start dividing. So um, those conferences were largely based on very basic research. And then there were people entering the field like this guy Lenzan I mentioned, and people like myself, I came in a little bit later after him, but they wanted to model disease. And they felt like this other conference wasn't as interested in that because they just wanted to look at, you know, only a develop normal development and not in, uh, models of disease. So uh, a group, it started with a group in the Netherlands and they had a conference and it was like 30 to 40 people and, uh, about 12 or 13 years ago, I think we're on meeting 14 now. And they had a meeting, it was like, I wasn't there until number three. They had 30 to 40 people. I went to number three and that was about 100 people. And all people who are interested in disease modeling, uh, you know, it may, so making models of disease. So I have all these bleeding mutant fish, hemophilia fish, von Willebrand disease fish, factor 10, and factor five, et cetera. And so um, they, got, they got together and then that eventually evolved into a society. And so the, the the latest meetings have had somewhere around probably or 500 to 1,000 participants. So that's what the Zebrafish Disease Model Society. And it's, it's trying to give support services or connections for people to exchange information in other ways and, and work together to advance the use of the zebrafish model for disease. Awesome. Well, I want in. I feel very uh, connected to zebrafish, um, and um, I, I, uh, I, I want to be part of the society. I'm very jealous. Um, well, you know, it's an international society, so it's like all over the world. Uh, it's, oh, it's a great one. Awesome. Well, if we can get in that, we certainly will. So the three people getting the mugs we randomly selected, drum roll, please. We have Johanna Cornell. Um, congratulations, you're getting a mug. The next one we randomly selected, Laura Tam, you're getting a zebrafish mug. And then the last one is Lisa. Lisa, you are getting a mug as well. So um, congratulations, guys. We hope that when we send you guys these mugs that you think of how research often starts with the zebrafish. And if you would like to buy a mug, we can show you the link. It is Amazon Prime and you can use Amazon Smile to help um, fun things like JGP, which Niha will be hopefully doing again this year. Um, so, but thank you, Maria. Thank you, Dr. Shavi. Incredible presentation. I learned a lot and I hope you all did as well. Um, we really appreciate your time. We wish we were in person doing this, but we will take the virtual um, aspect of it, um, uh, of course.
Um, but with that said, we want to promote our last part of Consumer Med. So that's Saturday. Um, it's two hours, uh, insurance, how to pay for it. And then we have the psychosocial um, a, as well. And then you'll have an opportunity um, to uh, speak with your um, industry reps of, of all of our presenting sponsors. So that's when the exhibit room um, will, will be open and then we're gonna kind of wrap up. So um, the link is going to be in the chat. Thank you, Brandon. Um, and a shout out to Brandon and Sarah and I think Gabby's on here too, doing an incredible job trying to make all this stuff virtual. We have a very small staff that's trying to really think outside the box here and they're doing a great job. Um, but with that said, we hope to see you Saturday. If not, this will have a recording. Thank you guys for believing in all these virtual programs. And again, thank you to Maria and thank you to Dr. Shavit. You guys did a great job. Um, hopefully we'll see you on Saturday. Take care. Thank you. I thank you everyone. It was a pleasure.